Dr. Marley Nats is a lecturer, an economist, uh, also a member of the Economic Advisory uh, Board. She is my guest, and uh, we're very fortunate to have her this morning. A very good morning to you, Doctor. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for inviting me, Mr. Bishop. Good morning to all of Trinidad and Tobago. It is good to have you here. I see you have been very busy. I spent the day anticipating, waiting for the budget uh, presentation. And while waiting there, there you were working full time. And there I go, pull you out on a Sunday morning and have you full, working full time again. Yes. Well, well, this is the time of the year for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's the, season. the budget was announced on Friday. But before we um, get down into the weeds, as it were, uh, how would you describe it? Would you call it tough? Fair, less draconian than expected, uh, optimistic, or too optimistic? Um, well, it's a loaded question, so let me see how best I can start. I, I think, um, like everybody else, we expected, I mean, we, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, would have expected some kind of austerity budget. And I think the minister tried his best in some of the, the work I would have done before the budget. I was certainly alluding to the fact that the minister would need to engage in a balancing act, um, a fair amount of austerity measures, because his hands simply are tied in terms of what he can and he can't do. But in imposing those austerity measures, he would need to be mindful that we already had a segment of the population under pressure. Mm -hmm. So that he would need to and of course, then he has his own political agenda um, because ultimately, you know, um, he is a politician. He had so he had to effectively throw all of these balls in the air and try to ensure that he came up with some kind of solution moving forward that would allow the country mm -hmm. to engage in um, what he calls transformation, but also ensure that the burden of that transformation and the austerity did not fall particularly hard on those segments of the population already already reeling, as it will, from some of the other things that have happened since this um, administration came into power in September of last year. So I think that was the context within which he had to operate. And of course, we know what has been happening with oil and gas prices. Um, in fact, the minister, when he presented his, his numbers, said that he's expecting total revenue of about $47.44 billion dollars. And for the first time, I think, in 60 years, he said, the, the contribution from oil would just be $2.5 billion. I mean, that I, I think we really need to appreciate what is happening now. And, and the non-oil revenue would come in at about $44.8 billion, which is what he's anticipating. So, so the minister very clearly from the outset signaled that it was mm -hmm. what I'm calling business unusual. This, mm -hmm. is not, um, this is not something that we have witnessed in a very long time, and the budget, I think, was set in that context. I think the Prime Minister, um, just before that, in fact, certainly going back as far as the midterm review, the Minister of Finance had signaled that things would have to be, would have to be very different. But, of course, um, from where I sit, I don't know that the message has had a lot of resonance. So, so in terms of what he presented last week, Friday, I personally would have liked to see things a little a little um, more austere, so to speak, mm. um, so that the message would be would be very clear that 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 we are in for some mm. some challenging economic times, and we would have to do things differently. We would have to recalibrate, as I said on another occasion, in terms of how we as citizens navigate inside of this situation. Nice, a uh, uh, very good answer. It actually uh, clearly differentiated between an economist and a politician. The politician must throw balls up in the air and have some considerations, and the economist is going to look at it and say, this is the medication you want. It may not be as palatable, but uh, this is what <laughs> you need. The IMF and the World Bank uh, project oil prices uh, next year will hover around $50. Uh, it begs the question, uh, and it prompts me to ask you the question, is it prudent? Uh, that the budget budget was based on forty eight dollars, uh, forty eight dollar price. I mean, is that is that smart considering that they are only looking at fifty and and oil prices vacillate like crazy sometimes. Yeah, I I was was kind of hedging my own bets that the minister would have gone in. He would have maintained the thirty five that he was using mm. based on the media review, and some others were saying forty. So anywhere between thirty five and forty, I think would have reinforced the point that, as you correctly said, that the oil price is vacillating and that we have to, to navigate and engage in economic management within, within a very uh, uncertain kind of environment. Um, the Saudis have already signaled um, that they want to essentially 
um, influence production. So, so that is there out in the open. We're not too sure what is going to happen geopolitically. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, so since we are effectively price takers when it comes to to the price of oil, I would have preferred something that was a lot more conservative, um, maintaining the 35 that the minister had used in the in the midterm review. Um, certainly not more than 40, but in his wisdom, he's gone to 48. Mm. And that is the basis on which he has um, projected revenue from the from the energy sector. What is it? Revenue is projected at, what, $47.4 billion, I believe. Which 47.4, is two, yeah. Right, which is $2.5 billion higher than it was last year. Yeah, when you yeah. consider the variables that you just articulated, mm-hmm. um, it is mighty curious at best uh, for one to expect more, considering that our, 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 our output yeah, is seriously well. compromised. Down, I mean, yeah. we've mm-hmm. got an old infrastructure That's we've got right, to work yeah, with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They've got to dig deep in yeah, order to find yeah. oil. It's more expensive to do that. And when you consider what um, folks write off in their taxes because of the exploration, mm-hmm. it will determine how much tax, in fact, you're taking home. But some of the companies already have signaled as well that they're going to be closing down for maintenance. So, I mean, it, 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 I mean that combination to me is not mm-hmm. a combination. Um, I'm not the Minister of Finance. I'm not one of his advisors. Mm-hmm. But certainly that combination of factors would not have led me to 48 um, dollars. I would have been a lot more conservative. But again, as I've always um, said, um, and as one minister many years ago said to me, there's a difference between the way politicians think and the way in which economists think. So I'm, I'm always quite <laughs> mindful of that. Economist uh, Dr. Marlene Ertz is with me this morning. We are going down into the weeds now of what the minister said in the budget presentation. But just before I do that, someone suggested that there's a song that would lay the foundation for the nation to pay attention to. And I will do that a little bit from the Mighty Sparrow and then we'll get up uh, to that discussion. The quality assessment but the message is clear. To rebuild, make up your mind to climb the hill. It's reconstruction time in Trinidad, so put your shoulder to the wheel, men, lad, move on, don't stop till you reach the top. You put a hand and I put a hand and we will see. For big and for small is no time at all. I think that's really the power of Calypso. You can take it about any point and it still tells the point. It still makes the message clear, right? Yes. Yeah, we'll go for one uh, one additional stanza from the Mighty Sparrow on this. Like I said, forgive me for the quality, but the message is very clear. It is 15 minutes after 11 o'clock and the Mighty Sparrow of Trinidad ever needed you is now you put a hand, I put a hand, and soon we will see prosperity. That's the way you weather the storm. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Marley Nets. We're talking about the uh, budget presentation. Doctor, how will the incremental removal of diesel subsidy that now sees an increase from uh, $1.98 to $2.30 per liter domino the cost of living, specifically in the area of food, as most of uh, food is trans transported via trucks using diesel fuel? Um, well, I've heard persons um, already come out and, mm-hmm. well, certainly the public, I think, some some segments of the population, they're unhappy with the increase in the price of diesel. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, your question really points to transportation. So I really want to use the opportunity to put this into, into context. Please. The cost of diesel is simply one component of the transportation cost. And I want to, to look specifically at the issue in the context of supermarkets, because I think that's where people think um, the supermarkets will use this as an opportunity and other business places that provide um, food. Let's let's take some of those basic, um, that kind of basic sort of um, desire that people have, access to food um, in the supermarkets, as it were. So, the, so diesel is really one component of that total transportation costs. You have maintenance of vehicles, etc., etc., etc. On the last occasion, when the the rollback of the fuel subsidies started in terms of super and diesel, I seem to recall on one of your programs, actually, we were talking to, to the president of the Supermarkets Association. So there was a rollback of the fuel subsidy that was a 12.5 um, watt, um, the reduction down from 15%. 
But all of that was happening at the same time when we were experiencing, and we continue to experience um, nationally, challenges in terms of the foreign exchange availability and the foreign exchange rate. Mm -hmm. And I recall on that occasion, you raised with the supermarket um, president the whole, question, mm -hmm. the whole question of, of people complaining about higher food prices, et cetera, et cetera. And at that point in time, he advanced uh, uh, th uh, 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 an argument, as it were, that or response that really what was happening well the price goes up the transportation costs the supermarkets have to pay more etc cetera, etc cetera. now I, I want to put that 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 there because i i disagreed with mr ibrahim i mean i i don't own a supermarket but i am a consumer mm -hmm. so i know what i experience in the supermarket so i i have a sense of the kinds of variations in prices in a very ad hoc way that we see in the supermarkets um, so that was one issue Mr. Hybrid, Ms. Hybrid spoke about in terms of the transportation costs. The other thing that happened at that particular point in time was when there was a reduction in VAT, the 12 point, point five to, um, from 15 to 12.5%, people also were complaining that they weren't seeing those prices reflected. And Mr. Ibrahim, if I recall, and I, I stand corrected, Mr. Ibrahim also said that because of the delay from the Ministry of Trade in sending out the revised list, that supermarkets did not have sufficient time to respond and ergo, we will see some kinds of imbalances in terms of the prices and that sort of thing. So the new rate will not be reflected. Doctor, that's a very accurate recall. All right. Um, so, I mean, I'm, it might appear as if I'm, I'm, I'm circumventing, but I want to put the diesel in the context of a whole lot of other things. Mm -hmm. Now, there has been, when the minister presented the, the midterm review earlier this year, he mentioned, and there was no mention in the budget last week, Friday, he mentioned that the government was contemplating moving to more flexible prices for gasoline, for fuels. So in the same way in which it obtains in the U.S. and the U.K. and even in Jamaica, our neighbor in Jamaica, um, Jamaica also has um, fuel prices that are flexible. So they don't enjoy a fixed rate as we do in Trinidad and Tobago. Mm. So in, in, my, in responding to your question, me and maybe... Um, my mother probably wouldn't be happy because I'm going to respond to your question with a question. How does a change in the fixed price of diesel or super gasoline ultimately result in such, and it's 40%, it's 40 cents, eh? um, um, let's be very clear, it's a 40 cents increase in the price of diesel. Mm -hmm. How does that then justify supermarkets deciding that this small component, it is not insignificant, but it is a small component of their transportation cost because maintenance of their fleet, maintenance of vehicles, I'm, I'm fairly certain is, is a much larger cost than the cost of the diesel um, per se, even at $2.30 per liter. How does that then justify, or it doesn't to my mind justify an increase in prices? And I then want to add on another corollary to that if in fact the government decides to move to a more transparent i mean it's going to be problematic and i don't think as a society we're ready for that yet if the government decides at some point in time that they want to move to a more flexible um uh price for 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 fuel so you enjoy one price today so today it's 325 tomorrow if the price of oil goes up you then have it at five dollars or 475 what then will the supermarkets do will, will supermarket prices be constantly changing so i say that to mean that i think as a population even though there has been this small adjustment and i'm glad that you introduced the sparrow the sparrow song i understand the difficult times that consumers and particularly the vulnerable people in our society are facing i am i am fully cognizant of that um but but desperate times call for desperate measures and i mm. think um wh while i would have liked to see the minister do something slightly differently in fact i would probably be more draconian than, than he was i think that we have to understand that I, even if you were to look at the numbers, and that's why I started with the numbers, we are going to only obtain two, almost $3 billion from our traditional source of revenue. And we're hoping to get the bulk of that from non oil, from the non oil sector. So $2.575 billion from oil and $44.9 billion, $866.866 billion from the non-oil sector, which in itself is going to pose a challenge mm -hmm. when you look at some of these sources of non-oil revenue that the minister is hoping to gather. So, so all of that uh, may seem circuitous, may seem long-winded, but I think it's important for us to put the discussion in context. Okay, and what we really need now, I think, in terms of, of looking at this issue of 
every time there is a 10 cents or 15 cents or 20 cents increase in the price of fuel, supermarkets or other suppliers say that with that, yeah, we're mm-hmm. going to increase things by a dollar and two dollars mm-hmm. because, you know, things are so very hard. Mm-hmm. I, I think as consumers, we have to we have to respond to that I, in terms of raising the level of conversation and say to, to whomever, well, you know, if that is your if that is your position, then perhaps I need to find somewhere else to shop because it's not all supermarkets. On the last occasion when the VAT was rolled back to 12, when the VAT was reduced to 12.5 percent, I personally went to four supermarkets Mm -hmm. and for a particular product that I, you know, I consume fairly regularly and there were four completely different prices for the same product. Mm -hmm. I mean, and even when the Ministry of Trade, the Consumer Affairs Division published their listing um, of what the prices should look like. I don't know if you recall looking at that document. I remember the document, yes. The prices varied. I mean, you had five, ten dollar variations across the yes, country. So is yes. all of that related to diesel costs that were increased, or is that related to other things? And what was contradictory about that is some of the prices uh, where uh, you actually paid less were in more remote areas. Precisely, <laughs> where the transportation costs mm-hmm. ostensibly are higher because mm-hmm. they have to come to some mm-hmm. central point, whether it's coming into Port of Spain or going into San Fernando to collect the goods or whatever the case might be. So, mm-hmm. so, so to me, there was a kind of arbitrariness in terms of how our prices are set and I I think there is a responsibility that the Ministry of Trade through its Consumer Affairs Division has um, to to bring some clarity to the discourse so that people don't simply presume that if there is a 20 cents increase in diesel or a 30 cents or a 40 cents increase in diesel I mean daily newspapers cost way more than that um, if there is that very small price, I am not saying that mm. some persons will not suffer. So your maxi taxis, you know, for them, um, maybe, but even so. They have an avenue in, to go to LNG. So we, guys. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> to CNG. You know, <laughs> we, 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 mm. we, we have to understand that this is not about um, the government's business. I mean, as the Sparrow song says, and, and it's, it's interesting how history sometimes repeats itself, this is really an opportunity for us to, to come together mm-hmm. in the service of trying to take our country forward because all of us have to live here and I think we all have to make some sacrifices at some point in time. But it's also an interesting thing for me to to talk about that even though people are complaining about the prices of fuel and there's been a lot of hue and cry after the last um, fuel subsidy rollback in terms of super gasoline and diesel, there is another contradiction because um, in preparing for the budget, you know, I would look at some of the documents that are put out there and the central bank's economic bulletin that I think came out earlier in September, about mid-September, made the point that consumer credit has been increasing significantly, and not just consumer credit. They, I'm quoting from them that loans for motor vehicles continue to record double-digit growth of 14.3% in the second quarter of 2016. Mm-hmm. This is this is after <laughs> the fuel subsidy had been rolled back. Yes. In the midterm report, with loans for new private cars accounting for most of the increase, about 17.6 percent of the of the increase in loans of motor vehicles was 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 loans for new private cars. So these aren't roll on roll off vehicles; mm-hmm. these are spanking new, drive them out of the of the showroom. So I think we have to be a little um, conscious of of how we respond to some things in terms of our knee jerk reactions, but then what we go out and do. So we go out and we take loans for new vehicles while complaining that the government should not have rolled back the fuel subsidy. Roughly paraphrase me, think that I protest too much, <laughs> and really, and really, and and, and there are those who uh, would just take advantage of every opportunity to find greater profit, and of course, the fuel subsidy will be blamed for that. I got you. Your mother will be uh, um, will be encouraged this morning that we did get a, a, a context as it were <laughs> in which we bet this <laughs> and that's as far as the uh, those who are directly um, using the diesel fuel uh, but the the station owners I'm looking at the president of the energy chamber of Trinidad and Tobago factory drivers suggesting there should be a liberalized liberalized system of fuel prices um, which is not um, far uh, at, uh, um, from what you were saying yeah, it's, uh, yeah maybe it's stand at least attention yeah, mm-hmm. to that to, to yeah. that issue um, let's go into the area of education. Mm-hmm. Uh, $7.3 billion. Health got um, 6.3. There are challenges uh, for education and buildings and shortages um, in, in the medical area in health. There are shortages in medical supplies. Did you expect more money to be given to, in that order, education, $7.3 billion, and health, $6.3 billion? 
to um, surmount some of the problems that we that we, that we face. Well, you remember, in terms of education, one of the things that the government is doing is that from the new academic year 2017-18, which will be around August um, of 2017, certainly for the University of the West Indies, and I think for many other tertiary level institutions, the new academic year starts at that time, August, September. Mm -hmm. Remember, the GATE program is going mm. to be scaled back somewhat. So there is going to be a reduction in terms of the expenditure that the government has signaled. Um, not all of the recommendations that, they've, that they're going to advance, I, I agree with. So that will account for some of the, the shortfalls. So the GATE program will be part of the, the, the allocation to the Ministry of Education, as it were. And then I think I saw in one of today's newspapers, if that were to be believed, because um, I haven't gone through line by line all of the estimates um, for the new budget, that UTT's allocation is reduced, um, as it were. So so you would see some shortfall there. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the Ministry of Health, again, I don't know what the line items are, but but I want us to, to perhaps... I, I want to suggest that 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 in looking at the allocations, it's to me it's not as much. Uh, I'm increasingly of the view that it's not as much of much importance how much is allocated. Yes, we need to have what the funding. Useful, how it's it's mm -hmm. how it is used yes, yes. and the accountability. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in fact, um, someone was saying to me this morning, maybe it's time we move to a balanced scorecard, which is which is a metric for accountability in terms mm -hmm. of what are your projected outcomes and whether or not you have actually met those outcomes. So that year after year, the conversation that seems um, very focused on who get more and who didn't get more, national security gets 7.6, education got 7.2, health got 6.2, agriculture got 766 million, um, which, you know, in, 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 in general terms, I think, we, we need to be careful about some of the signals. But that said, is the use to which the funds are gotcha. put. Um, so at the end of the day, at the end of the fiscal year, mm -hmm. we can either say that we got bang for our buck, you know, we, we were able to make some improvements in terms of taking this process forward, or we weren't able to make some improvements. So even if it was $7.6 um, billion for national security, we have not seen some kind of reduction in crime levels or, 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 or criminal activity that we think really is reflective of that kind of investment. So I would want us to move the conversation away simply from looking at the, at the, dollar, itself, fact, yes. the dollar factor, the dollar, mm -hmm. the dollar value of the, of, the, of the allocation to the use to which and whether or not the outcomes are actually, because when, when, you have, when you have fewer resources as we have now, I think the issue really is return on investment. Yes. The issue really is whether you're getting bang for your buck. The issue is really whether or not what you're spending is giving you the kind of return that you want to get as opposed to, you know, you're throwing a lot of money behind it, which is why I welcome some of the changes um, to the GATE program in mm -hmm. terms of, um, you know, recalibrating the GATE to, to in, in such a way that it, it ties into the national development priorities. But as I said, some of the some of the other recommendations mm -hmm. in terms of the gate program, I don't necessarily agree with with them because I don't think that that um, that they will help us achieve the kind of um, human capital development that we want to have. Thirty minutes after eleven o'clock, my guess is uh, Dr. Marlene Etz. We are talking about the budget, and you're quite right. Let's say instead of doing the allocation, stay into the weeds, as it were. Among the re relief measures announced uh, is that at the beginning of December. Uh, that's December 1, persons whose monthly electricity bill is $300, as you rightly pointed out, will get a 25% rebate in electricity charges. Are you satisfied with that? And do you see other areas of relief for low-income earners and pensioners on fixed incomes? Well, I think the, the, uh, the electricity... Um that 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 move is in, is interesting, and I think it will be welcome. It will be welcome relief. Not too sure it will be operationalized, but I imagine mm -hmm. that the three hundred or less, you would simply just um, take the seventy five dollars off the top and probably have it reflected in the next bill. So there'll be a deduction or something like that. Um, but the government has promised to to honor the commitment to TNTEC and how many ever, and they said that's twelve hundred twenty thousand households likely to benefit from that. So I think there can't be and of those hundred twenty thousand households. I suspect that we have many pensioners inside of there. So so I think that is that is very that is very welcome. 
Um, the other thing that the government said is that the the in terms of housing, they wanted to increase the ability of low income earners to afford housing. Mm-hmm. So the two percent borrowing facility for persons earning no more than ten thousand per month to those earning forty. Um, they made some provision there for them, a five percent borrowing facility for persons, etc. Um, so you can benefit from some of those things. So so there are some some forms of relief inside of there for low income earners didn't hear too much um for pensioners per se i mean apart from the pensioners who i presume some of whom will fall into that hundred and twenty thousand household mm. in terms of the electricity in terms of the electricity mm. um rates um not too clear on the details with respect to the to the property tax what exceptions can be made because the minister said um, I'm going on memory now that he said that some of the that they, there is, there is a provision for for some relief for persons inside of this. I don't know if it will mm-hmm. apply to pensioners. What what specifically the legislation says in terms of who can benefit from that relief to which he to which he referred. Um, so so generally, I think those were some of the some of the things identified for for low income household, households in terms of some of the housing. Um, Ten to fourteen thousand dollars in terms of income, but also the electricity rates. What I would call, what I would have liked to see more of is in terms. And coming back to the original question about the diesel and the food, I still would like to see some kind of control monitoring mechanism inside of this, so that in terms of the food prices, mm-hmm. because I think that is, and mm-hmm. I mean, apart from my experience of, of the four supermarkets charging four different prices for the same product and the same D. Mm-hmm. Um, um, because I use a lot of my super gasoline to go to drive around <laughs> to supermarkets to mm. check it to check it one day. Um, there is, mm. you know, I I know of situations where where pensioners, you know, who buy medication and and you know um, other kinds of 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 sustenance that that they use, medical supplies or even food supplies that they that they use, um, being. S- subjected for want of a better word to varying prices and of course the argument is no longer um the vat or whatever it is it's not the foreign exchange so the shortage of foreign exchange because mm-hmm. these are imported mm-hmm. goods that they have to imported products mm. um many of which are like like healthcare products because of that they're now saying that you know there are variations in prices for oh, medication you, oh, you, you mean the same medication that they bulk purchase at substantially reduced prices but um. well <laughs> yeah, probably some of those yes. you know earlier when you when you did mention the consumer affairs division because mm-hmm. i would think it is incumbent on the planners that when you have a situation like this changing fortunes in the economy or even without changing mm-hmm. that you have price control inspectors yeah. i mean real i mean you know you have an unemployment institution i can employ people and just on what i charge because you'll be charging a lot of mm-hmm. people just on what i charge for those who who, who take advantage of a situation, I can pay the salaries of these yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. We, we need to have those people inside of there. Dr. Atz, I was looking over um, the last time you were here with us, and your pet peeve, um, uh, which is a good one in my, in my view, is that the rich must pay their fair share of taxes or shoulder their share of the readjustment burden via the 30% tax for higher income earners whose chargeable incomes exceed uh, $1 million per year. Was this acceptably addressed well, Mr. Bishop, I, I must admit I don't know many persons. I don't know if I know any person who, who falls into that category. But, um, <laughs> Neither do I. Yeah. But um, <laughs> probably businesses. But I think mm. we need to be a little clear on what that measure means. Mm-hmm. If you earn between $1 and $1 million, mm-hmm. your rate is 25%. If it's over $1 million, then it goes That's to right. 30%. Mm. So... If I were earning a million dollars a year, and I need to be very careful how I say this because um, at another media house on Friday, I was told I sound like Donald Trump. Yes, <laughs> creative accounting. Is yes. What? <laughs> um, I see that coming. You know, so, I mean, really, if I earned a million dollars a month, mm. I possibly um mm. could become fairly creative to show that mm. I actually earn nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine dollars and let the business incre- include something like a increased pension um, um health package or something on yes, the side because yes. what 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 then happens and again mm. this comes back to the institutional framework that we have for implementing and for monitoring and for enforcing some of these 
measures that the minister would have announced. Because for every measure that he announced, every fiscal measure that he announced, he associated with it some kind of revenue collection to help him um, find his his 40, 47, his $44 billion. Mm-hmm. If there is not an appropriate mechanism, and I mean, if you look at things like the like the ease of doing business report um, that says Trinidad and Tobago is ranked 88 out of 189 countries. <laughs> mm-hmm. And there are two things that they identified which put us so low down that ranking. One, our procurement or lack thereof and our ability to collect taxes. So unless you have an appropriate, effective implementation agency to do these things, mm-hmm. I mean, it is fairly, it is fairly easy for one to become creative in terms of how one treats with these measures. So mm. what might appear to be a punitive measure, um, I I am fairly certain that, as I said, if I earned a million dollars a month, I, I would have, you, you would know. get creative. Y- well, I would have people who would get creative for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, mm-hmm. so, I mean, it, 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 you know, I think we, we have to wait and see how that plays out because there are any number of ways... You split income between two or more persons. You know, they're, 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 I mean, there are a whole lot of ways in which we can do this. So the enforcement, I think, and the implementation Isn't and the monitoring really is what is take, what we need to look at. Take it into the area of companies mm-hmm. are paying their fair share. Were you satisfied with the measure there? Well, the same thing would apply. The same thing, the yes, same thing would apply, yes, you know, yes. whether or not... The is the same yes. Is the mm. same 25 as opposed to 30%. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it would be the same kind of thing that we would have to look at to see mm. whether or not um, the... BIR, which has not been able to to collect taxes in the past, whether or not um, they suggested changes, because the minister was um, a bit more adamant in this occasion that the the revenue authority is going to be in place in 2017. So I think when the debate starts on Thursday, a lot of these things, I suppose, some of the details will come out. Um, but hopefully, mm-hmm. where, where the BIR was not able to to collect or to get um, greater levels of compliance that the, the, the mechanism or the institutional framework of the Revenue Authority will be able to so do um, when it comes on stream. Yeah, I was um, I was a bit I, I, I was a bit um, taken aback when I, I, I saw the same thirty percent um, applying to businesses because I can't think of many businesses. I mean, I think it's really mom and pop that's not clearing a million dollars. Yeah, that's a, right. A, a, a year and uh, effectively, what you're looking at is a five percent increase. Sure. Um, <laughs> all right, I want to go into the area of property taxes. Mm-hmm. Um, that is part again that was uh, in the last budget. It was spoken of the last time, mm-hmm. and, and and what we talk about property taxes dependent on the completion of evaluation role prepared by the Commission of Evaluation. Mm-hmm. The assessment assessment role will then be done and handed to the Inland Revenue Division. Mm-hmm. The collection of this. Are you optimistic that the Treasury will see any of this money in 2017? In fiscal 2017? Yes. yes because I of, think well, that's bec- because of Because of the... the, the oh, the you process. mean in terms of the process? Yes, the process. I think there will be some mechanism. Um, I don't know. It, it depends on how soon, of course, the the valuations become available that that the well presumably the valuations will be easily available will be easily accessible and hopefully they'll have correct information mm-hmm. um and on that basis as mm. as i understand it, it's three percent for residential property um and 3.5 percent for for mm-hmm. vacant land so i mean and it would be it will be the annual rental value less 10 percent to cater for the periods when the property isn't rented as the case might be so um, again, this is something that I think people need to fully understand. It is not the capital cost. It's not the cost of the property. It is the the, ren- the rental value, the annual rental value for the property, um, the annual taxable value, which is the annual rental, the, the, antel- the annual rental value less 10%. So that people need to understand what this means. And I think, again, there needs to be greater um, information dissemination and in terms of how this is going to be rolled out. But your point about compliance and whether or not, again, the minister is going to be able to realize all of the revenues that he's anticipating from this particular measure, we will have to wait and see because we have historically had some inefficiencies in terms of the Board of Inland Revenue, which have um, prevented the collection of the taxes as we would like them and the, and the amounts of the taxes, the quantums that we would have liked. Um, so we wait to see. He he keeps saying that he he kept saying the minister kept saying in his presentation on Friday that they have effected some changes. So we we wait and see whether or not those changes are sufficient to 
to take us forward in terms of the transformation that he's hoping to realize. We always are fortunate to have you here. And every time I have you here, I take advantage of your ability to translate because you can sit down and you can listen to a budget presentation for an hour. You can barely survive an hour and a half. When you get into three hours, you fall asleep. Oh, and all, all the numbers just uh, sound like a whole lot of numbers unless unless you are in it as deeply as you are as an economist and you can tell yourself, okay, prioritize your prioritize there or clearly understand it. Now, for instance, part of the part of the area here of how this budget uh, will bring revenue, they are what? 31 Korea companies registered and bonded in Trinidad and Tobago. It's estimated the value of packages declared by these companies exceed $1 billion annually. To the best of your expert knowledge, is the mechanism in place to collect the taxes um, from which, which is a result of a whole lot of online purchasing and so mm-hmm. on. How much of that can we expect to see? Scale one to ten, or use the hundred um, mark and give me a percentage out of that. How much of that can we expect to see because of the infrastructural setup we have in place? Well, since I didn't walk with my crystal ball, <laughs> um, I can't. I can't give. I can't give a percentage, so to speak. But what I can do is, again, try to bring some clarity to the issue. Mm-hmm. Um, not to preclude anything that might happen in the debate, mm-hmm. which starts on Thursday, but I think there are a couple of things that need to be, to be clarified. Is it all goods coming in, or are some goods going to be exempt? If I were bringing in books, for example, for education purposes, if I were bringing a computer, those are the kinds of things that need to be clarified, whether or not... Um, they will be subjected to the 7%. So there needs to be clarity on the categorization and whether it's a flat 7% or whether there will be variations. Because I understand the objective. The objective is to minimize the leakage of foreign exchange because, again, as I've made the point um, elsewhere, every time people punch in that, credit card to whichever overseas supplier they punch in the credit card and whichever bank that is based in Trinidad and Tobago, that is a demand on foreign exchange. Mm -hmm. So you might see coming up on your credit card statement, just before you say confirm the transaction, you might see 5,000, 6,000, let me make the arithmetic easy, you might see 6,900 TT dollars on your credit card. You're not paying that overseas supplier 6,900 TT dollars. You're paying them 1,000 US dollars. And the bank has to remit 1,000 US dollars in short order. Mm. All right, so, so let's be clear about that. So, so that's the first thing. The minister, as I said, has to clarify whether it's a flat 7% or whether they will have exemptions to that in terms of categories of goods. Also, um, the amount of the purchase. Is it going to be if I spend $20, the $7 will apply. If I spend $100, if I spend $1,000, if I spend $10,000, will it be one flat $7 fee, um, 7% that, that applies? I think all of those details mm-hmm. um, need to come out. Now, the minister said that mm-hmm. for the time being... Um, he said air freight. He said air freight only. Um, so so that is at least some point of clarification that he has, in fact, provided. Mm-hmm. Now, the other thing that I want to throw inside of there in terms of the mix, the minister assumes, and in economics, we talk about something called elasticity of demand, price elasticity, income elasticity, etc. Not going to go into all of the details, but the minister assumes that by putting that 7% tax online, it will deter people. Mm-hmm. That is his presumption he has made an assumption that the people who shop online with those credit cards will be very disturbed because he has imposed a seven percent so two things if the goods that people are demanding they see them as having an inelastic demand the price can go up because the seven percent effectively increases the price of that particular commodity if it increases the demand I might either have the wherewithal, I might so want this particular good that the 7% does not bother me. Mm-hmm. I will pay you your 7%. If, however, the 7% is on a good that I consider to be elastic in mm-hmm. terms of economic price elasticity of demand, so as the price goes up, I will curtail my demand, then his foreign exchange problem is going to be solved. So whether he makes more money or whether his foreign exchange problem is going to be solved depends on how I see Mm -hmm. the good. If the good is inelastic, he will make a lot of money on my head, as in the case of alcohol, just jumping the gun. Mm -hmm. Um, The way in which Trinidadians, Trinbagonians, we treat alcohol is that, you know, um, for many persons, in fact, I've heard some people commenting that, you know, whether the price goes up, you know, bars will still make money Mm. and the minister by Mm. extension will still make money. 
Um, so, so there are all of these things that go into the mix. So, so it's not even getting to the point of collection. And as I understand from the minister's statement, what is going to happen is that the the courier companies will then have a new line item on their invoices. Um, so there will be the cost, the value of the good. There will be the VAT at twelve point five percent. There will be the customs duties, whatever other charges are there. And now there'll be this new line item of 7% mm. that is going to be remitted ultimately um, to the central bank. Now, the mechanism for that is unclear to me because it is the same. I'm thinking it, I mean, again, in the absence of the details, and some of the details may come out when the debate starts on Thursday. But I'm thinking through the same way in which we have non-compliance, and I'm not suggesting that the courier companies are going to start off thinking, well, you know, we're going to try to avoid this because there's more money that we make. Because the money goes, in the first instance, to the couriers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to the courier company. Um, but in the mm -hmm. same way in which we've had non-compliance with respect to VAT payments to, to businesses remitting VAT to the Board of Inland Revenue, um, and that is a challenge that the Board of Inland Revenue has had um, from time immemorial, there... In order for the minister to realize the objective of getting the revenue from this particular source, he will also have to plug that particular gap. Um, so the courier companies, there has to be some very clear, unambiguous mechanism to get them to remit mm -hmm. that in short order to the um, <laughs> to the relevant authorities. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not too sure what, what that mechanism is right now. Mindful that every time you plug a hole, they're working three and four times ahead of you to open some new ones or to, to explore some others uh, ahead of to not see diversification. Mm -hmm. um, as you did say, um, uh, a lot of the expectation of the exchequer, of the minister, is um, in non-traditional revenue, We not, you know, not, not from the oil sector. So the question of diversification, it seems to me uh, as though the, what I have heard is that the thrust is going to be in tourism, a quick turnaround situation. Look at um, what is um, uh, uh, viewed for Tobago and the money that's given to the Tobago House of Assembly, though a lot of that seems to be going for expenditure, but that's a whole different discussion. Just dealing specifically in the area of diversification, did you get sufficient uh, enough coming out of the budget that spoke to how we develop industry here, creating new revenue-generating sources? Did you see any of that, at the, uh, and what specifically coming out of the budget? Well, there were a couple of things mentioned. Um, in terms of agro-processing, for example, the minister said that, you know, he is going to um, tax exemptions to persons who are approved agro-processors, agro-processing op operations. Um, so that provides a kind of fillip, as it were. So it's mm. not, and he was very clear, if I recall, again, him saying that it's not if you import pulp and you then want to try and, you know, make it into juice. It's not that. <laughs> it's using local materials so that the value added... Um, the net impact is positive in terms of the local economy. You will enjoy some relief in that regard. There was the whole question of um, yacht repair for non-residents, so the VAT exemption, um, and presumably that will build um, build up that particular sector in terms of the skills in the yacht repair, as it were. Um, but then, as you correctly mentioned, there was there was a big ticket item in terms of tourism in Tobago and. Um, and, and, and of course, all associated and surrounding the, the Sandals investment. Um, I've not followed all of the details in terms of the specifics, um, the details of what, what has been offered to Sandals, but mm -hmm. presumably there have been a lot of incentives offered to Sandals. The minister went, he was at pains to say that, you know, there's going to be 2,000 or thereabout in terms of direct employment from the Sandals operation in Tobago, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, my concern, and I have to say it, is that um, the extent to which infrastructure is being put in place or mechanisms are being put in place to support the Sandals investment, the question that I would like to raise is what is happening to support the local um, bed and breakfast, yeah, the smaller hotels that we have in Tobago that have been there, some of them are family-owned businesses that have, you know, been there over time. They have greater linkages to the domestic economy in terms of the fisher folk, in terms of the agricultural sector, etc. What mechanism is there in place to safeguard 
um, those operations. I because, have folks, I'm sorry, please mm-hmm. go ahead. Be- because as I understand it, Sandals, I think I heard the minister say on Friday, because as you correctly noted, after sitting in studio and listening to it for three hours after a while, you know, things kind of get a little fuzzy. I think he said there are actually two hotels, one that would be um, a family-based hotel mm-hmm. and one that was going to um, not, 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 not family-based for want of a better description. So with that size of infrastructure and, and Mr. Mr. Sandals is well known in terms of, you know, his 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 investments in the tourism sector in Jamaica and other parts of the Caribbean. Um, what then happened to the small and medium um, type hotels that have, in fact, um, been the backbone of the tourism sector in Tobago? So that's one question. But another attendant issue is in terms of infrastructure. Southwest Tobago has traditionally had and minister alluded to it on friday they've traditionally had very serious challenges with respect to water and sewage mm-hmm. infrastructure mm-hmm. um there's some horror stories that i can tell which i won't go into right now what is happening to provide that that supporting infrastructure not for sandals per se but for those smaller tourism infrastructure those smaller tourism businesses establishments yeah this year uh, just last year and the beginning of this year the hotel industry across there complained about uh, guests uh, who are staying in there with no water for prolonged periods so i know exactly uh, what you're speaking about and the explanation that has been advanced by wasa did not really clarify or bring about a solution so you're quite right yeah i mean i know going back to 19 um 95, 96, 97, I forget when, when I'd done some research on infrastructure in Southwest Tobago, there were plans. At that time, it was recognized that the infrastructure, in terms of water and sewage infrastructure, was insufficient um, to support the tourism thrust in Southwest Tobago. Mm. And I don't know that any significant investments in water and sewage infrastructure in Southwest Tobago have, in fact, taken place between then and now. So... So while we may want, to, and presumably there would have been the, the economic impact assessment studies done that show that Mr. San, Mr. Mr. Sandal, Butch Stewart's investment mm-hmm. um, is going to redound to the benefit of the Trinbagonian economy in terms of trying to help us plug some of these um, shortfalls, as it were, in terms of income, et cetera, and employment generation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my concern really is whether or not that will crowd out some of the smaller traditional tourism establishments that we've had as in one question, because that's where the Trinidad tourists go. I mean, when Trinbagonians flock to Tobago, whether it's for jazz festival yeah. or for the August vacation or whatever the case might be, those are the places where Little they B&B, go. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm, the, the bed mm-hmm, and breakfast types mm-hmm. of things. I, I hardly think that the average Trinvigonian tourist is going to go to Sandals when they go across there. And I don't think that Mr. <laughs> Sandals is necessarily going to be catering for the average um, Trinidadian tourist going across so to Tobago. So you, you don't buy into this idea that uh, some, have, uh, some have advanced that uh, because of Sandals' effort and, and the recognition of his brand, it will bring such, bring such recognition to Tobago that even um, that, uh, th- th- that advertising and that wide, wide, widespread um, publicity is not necessarily bringing people only for Sandals, but bringing more people to Tobago and as such, the other industries, the other small ho- smaller hoteliers will benefit from it. Well, Mr. Bishop, I have a slightly different view. Um, <laughs> there is, of course, a Walmart um, situation where they absorb everything <laughs> around. Um, I mean, if we look at tourism in Tobago, mm. let, let me let me kind of locate this. So people go to Tobago. Um, sun, sea, and sand is a tropical paradise. I mean, I love Tobago. You know, you go to Tobago, there a lot of the tourists outside of those peak periods I spoke about are uh, uh, British, European tourists, as it were. Now... For several reasons. So we know now with the the departure of Britain from the Brexit or that pending departure, we know there's some things happening in the European Union. We're not too sure how they will impact on tourists wanting to come down to the Caribbean mm-hmm. in terms of that tourism resource with things like climate change and global warming and the fact that if you travel from Britain to come to the Caribbean, more often than not, there is an emissions charge included in your ticket because British Airways or some of those European carriers mm. um, may um, have opted to include that to offset their carbon footprint. So, I mean, the discussion about tourism is not simply about getting people inside of sandals. I think that discussion has to be located in a larger context. 
Um, do we have the skilled person? So we're talking about GATE and we're talking about recalibration of the GATE program in terms of how we're going to change GATE. Have we started to do any kind of foresighting to identify how many workers will be needed by Sandals in what particular skills areas mm. so we can begin to target training in those areas and identify those as some of the priority areas for financing under the GATE program? I mean, these are discussions that presumably have already been had when the decision was taken to invite sandals. So to me, it's not simply a question of of the sandals brand in Tobago. And once the sandals brand is in Tobago, then everything else is going to fall in place. I think this has to be a very carefully thought through. And presumably, some of the work has already been done. Because even in Jamaica, sandals is facing competition. If you look at mm. the North Coast, um, you have the Rio chain of hotels. A whole number of other hotels are giving sandals competition in Jamaica. So I think um, we need to be, we, I think we need to look at the landscape of tourism and not simply say that if we bring a particular brand, it is going to yield the kinds of results that we want because this is a significant investment mm -hmm. um, for Mr. Sandals. It's also a significant investment for Trinidad in terms of the incentives that I'm sure have been put in place to get Mr. Sandals to want, Mr. Mr. Stewart, sorry, I keep mm -hmm. saying Mr. Sandals. Same thing, interchangeable, <laughs> interchangeable. Um, <laughs> you know, in terms of the... <clears throat> In terms of the invest, in terms of the incentives that have been put on the table mm -hmm. to even get Mr. Stewart to want to come to invest in Tobago, but then there are manpower requirements. Who is going to work in these hotels? What levels of skills are we going to ensure that that our people are going to be positioned at the highest levels in these hotels? And therefore, what kinds of skills trainings s skills training is required to ensure that we are ready to capitalize on this opportunity that Mr. Stewart is going to present. There is also still the question of what kind of uh, tax incentives are be be being given for him to be here and whether in fact that will offset, offset what it is proposed as a gain for the country. But that is a whole different talk show. Dr. Marlene Etz, uh, <laughs> economist, member of the Economic Development Advisory board uh, my guest this morning inside uh, brunch I do have a final question for you you alluded to it earlier you referenced it earlier rather um, and your colleague um, dr. Terence Farrell said he was neither disappointed nor surprised that the country dropped five places from last year um, of the 138 countries we ranked 94th in the global competitive 2016-2017 uh, report this is a challenge and that is not divorced from our budget. It is all part and parcel of this weathering the storm and or uh, surmounting these challenges that we must do something about the productivity in this country. Um, what, 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 what is your outlook on this? Is there a, 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 real, uh, a realistic direction that we can take uh, to bring about this change. I mean, it is it is attitude, it is a so-called culture uh, thing in Trinidad and Tobago, but more and more, regardless of what the government would do with a budget, regardless of what you re would recommend as an economist, I go back to Dr. Farrell, who accurately said, people are depersonalizing the problem by saying it's institutionals, institutions that are failing, because when we do that, we take ourselves out of the loop of not producing. Mm. Well, I mean, the first thing, and I think, I don't know if uh, the institutions are, in fact, the people. So the institutional the, framework, precisely. the institutions yes. are, in fact, the people. Mm -hmm. So the institutional framework to which I've referred on several occasions today is, in fact, the people. It is not the building. It is the people inside of there. And people, I think it all comes down, the question of productivity all comes down to accountability at different levels. So we can talk about the government, whether or not, in fact, um, we're seeing productivity coming out of the government, whether mm -hmm. we're seeing productivity coming out of the private sector, the public sector. And, um, and of course, the, the famous um, example that people always use is, is, is CPEP, as it were, um, CPEP and the URP, that they're not productive. But I mm -hmm. think it is the way in which these programs are operationalized. Um, and the fact that there is no accountability, and it's not just CPEP. You can also talk about accountability and productivity in different spheres. And, and it's really, do I, get, do I get, again, if you want to put it in this context, bang for my buck. So you're paid a monthly wage, and there is no accountability. So whether or not you produce, unless, of course, you're in the kind of factory type setting where your productivity is determined by the number of units of output per day. But there are other ways in which you can measure it in the service-based industry. How many requests have we had 
for service X, Y, and Z? How long does it take you to respond to those kinds mm. of issues? How many complaints have we had against you? If we encourage people to come out and talk about their experience in a particular um, sector, in a particular business environment, how many complaints have we had against you, Mr. Bishop? I mean, if we have a lot of complaints against you, then clearly something is wrong. Um, how long does it take for you to respond? So mm. if someone submits an application form today, and really what is required in terms of taking that application form from one individual to the next individual is a five minute ticking off of a box. Mm -hmm. Then why does it take seven days? So you submit some forms in some, some businesses and I tell you, come back in five to seven days. And then you actually realize that it probably takes five, 10 minutes to get it done. So, <laughs> so there are different ways and different metrics that we can use to measure productivity. But I think it ultimately comes down to someone taking responsibility to be accountable for what is done or not done on a daily basis or an hourly basis, as the case might be. And, and yes, um, last year I presented at the Chamber's post-budget presentation and and I used um, the local rhetoric last year. We had a song called I Duck In It. And I mean, that's really our, <laughs> our mentality. If we can get away with not doing something, um, you know, rather than doing it, you know, mm -hmm. it's, you know, we feel some, some, some thrill that we were able to, to evade, which is how we have all of these challenges with non-compliance with respect to taxes, et cetera, because it is really a question of accountability. You call some offices and they will tell you that, no, that person isn't in today. And you ask them, you know, well, I submitted a form last week. Can you, um, can you help me with that particular form? And they say, well, no, I'm not the person who handles that. In fact, I, because I, I, I speak about these things both as an economist, but also as a consumer, I'm actually waiting on, on someone from a particular company to call me back since last week, Monday. He said he would call me by five o'clock last week, Monday. But maybe I misunderstood. Maybe it's five o'clock this Monday. So I'm, I'm waiting to see. So, you know, these are, these are issues that I think we really yeah. have to deal yeah. with, but it comes down to accountability in terms of how we operate. And it has to start at every level. Precisely. And including our governments. Including what's going on in the public domain, which is a whole different talk show again. Um, <laughs> accountability, that is the issue. Dr. Marlene Nats, uh, thank you so much for taking of your day to be with us. And like I said to you before, it is always a pleasure to have you here because of the clarity you bring uh, in a non-budget presentation way. So folks can actually follow the dots. You make the, you clear, clear, clear up the dots for us this morning. Thank you so much. Hope to have you back soon. And I hope that you have a very good day today.